Good morning. Welcome to our video conference. Adult Protection Investigation Determinations. September 12th, 2019. Sponsored by Aging and Adult Services, Minnesota Department of Human Services. My name is Kelly Klein. And I am Angelo Flowers. Now I'm going to read the ADA advisory. This information is available in alternative formats to individuals with disabilities by calling 651-431-2500 or toll free at 1-800-882-6262 or by using your preferred relay service. For other information on disability rights and protections, contact the agency's ADA coordinator. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for attending our video conference. My name is Angelo Flowers. I am the Adult Protection Resource Specialist for the, all of the metro um, counties and the southern counties of the state. My name is Kelly Klein. I'm an Adult Protection Resource Specialist. I handle most of the counties north of the metro, including now Region 4, up to the Canadian border. All right. So let's go over our learning objectives for today. Today we will review the context and the importance of AP investigation determinations. We will recognize relevant evidence and how to weigh evidence for APS investigation determinations and applicable evidence standards for AP investigations to make a supportable conclusion. And our third objective is to identify potential ethical dilemmas and how to support safety of the vulnerable adult during the investigation. Okay, so again, to reiterate our objectives, uh, we will give an overview of the Minnesota Adult Protection and APS investigation determinations. So what is adult protection? Adult Protection Services, APS, promotes the safety, independence, and quality of life for a vulnerable adult who is being maltreated and is unable to protect themselves. So while this description is very basic and it was adopted from the NCEA fact sheet about protective services, we want to keep in mind things like safety, independence, and quality of life when we are working with vulnerable adults. So again, although that is a very basic boiled down definition, we always want to be considering their safety, their independence, independence and their quality of life. So the principles of adult protection. Adult protection seeks to achieve simultaneously freedom, safety, the minimal disruption to lifestyle, and the least restrictive care. So remember that the adult client is the only person adult protection workers are charged to serve. When there are competing interests, adult protective services does not serve the community that is concerned about safety, landlords concerned about their property, citizens concerned about crime or morality. Again, they are charged with caring, serving for the adult client. So adult clients are in charge of their own decision making until they either voluntarily delegate those responsibilities to someone or if a court grants that responsibility to someone. And then the last, um, uh, number three here on this slide, all adults have the right to self-determination. And this is probably the most important of those three. Adu um, all adults have the right to determine uh, self-determination. That includes the possibility that an adult chooses to live in harm or they make self-destructive choices. Provided that they are competent to choose, they do not harm others and do not commit a crime, they do have that freedom, and that freedom is more important than safety. So again, their right to self-determination impedes, impedes their safety at times. They can, as long as they are able to make an informed choice, they understand the consequences of that choice. We have to use the full range of social work skills when serving that client to ensure that they are fully aware of the alternatives. 
So let's review for a minute. Only a court can restrict a person's right to make decisions for themselves. Not all adults are vulnerable adults. Not all reported allegations are maltreatment. Mark accepts all reports of alleged maltreatment made by a reporter. There may be ethical conflicts when we honor that self-determination of the client. All of our adult protective services principles apply in every report. And adult protective services applies several different approaches in handling a case, um, such as trauma-informed approach. We always have to treat the client with respect, be honest, show compassion, identify their capacity to make informed decisions. Uh, we use the supportive decision-making tools. Our license agencies provide protection through licensing um, actions and the county-led investigative agencies protect through social services. So again, to restate our three principles from the, pre um, from the slide, excuse me, adult protection seeks to ach achieve simultaneously the freedom of the client, the safety of the client, making minimal disruptions to their lifestyle through the least restrictive care. The adult client is the only person that we are charged to serve when there are competing interests. And the third, all adults have the right to self-determination. Thank you, Angela. I wanted to add also, county lead investigative agencies provide protection through what they provide through their social service agency. And we also want to remember that APS is a voluntary um, program for all participants within um, a case. Investigation of allegation and alleged perpetrator is not voluntary or dependent on the VA's consent as well, which is important for all of us to know. So let's talk about lead investigative agencies. We call them LIAs for short. So we'll be using interchangeably adult protective services, but that is at the county level. So the county adult protective services, the Minnesota Department of Health, also known as OHFC, Office of Health Facility Complaint, uh, Complaints, and then DHS Licensing, which is also OIG, Office of Inspector General. Those are our three um, investigative, um, lead investigative agencies. So the LIA is the primary administrative agency responsible for, one, responding to the reports, um, reports that are made to Mark, and two, making investigation decisions. The duties, so just um, let me back up, just to add some clarity, suspected uh, maltreatment reports are made to the state uh, of Minnesota's common entry point, we call it MARC, um, as I said before, but that stands for Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center. And we commonly use that acronym, MARC. Uh, MARC then refers the report to the appropriate lead investigative agency. And so county social services are one of them, and that'll be the focus today of our session. Um, but MDH, they um, investigate any assistant living, hospitals, nursing homes, home care, and DHS licensing investigates any uh, licensed uh, services like facilities, home or community-based services, and then self-neglect or any cases, for example, that include uh, personal care assistance, maltreatments by a friend, a family member, or types of scams, those are usually handled by the county adult protective services. So again, let's go over some of the duties of the LIA. They immediately respond to the report. They use their prioritization guidelines for investigation decisions. They have five days to notify the reporter of the initial disposition, so that's five business days. They conduct the required investigation activities, and they have 60 days to make a determination about the allegation, and there are five, and Kelly will revisit these, um, and then uh, she will visit these in the next slide, but they are substantiated, false, inconclusive, not a vulnerable adult or unable to investigate. And all of them require notifications. Another side note, APS investigations 
is one part of adult protective services. General protective services is another part, and we want to stress that to all of the county partners out there. You can help hold accountable those responsible for the administrative maltreatment. You can support justice for VAs who have experienced maltreatment. It's a task that you do as an investigator, but first and foremost, you're a social worker. So we wanted to make sure we stress that today. So Kelly, you want to talk about determinations? I would love to. So Adult Protective Services has two hats. One, we investigate, and two, we provide services and supports to the VA and their support system. Now these hats sometimes become a little bit complicated. We can't ignore that sometimes determinations may impact your ability to work with the vulnerable adult or help the vulnerable adult to get them to accept services or look at the choices that they make in regards to how it impacts their safety or their well-being. So today we're going to discuss these challenges uh, in this video conference and what we want to be able to preface is that we want you to be able to learn and become really skilled at engaging the vulnerable vulnerable adults to accept services and engage them with the assessment and the service offerings. So first and foremost, we have a threshold of evidence that's different. Um, our threshold is preponderance. And so we also are using this preponderance threshold as um, noting that it's a 51% and it's a civil administrative investigation that uses, they both use, whoa. That was tongue-tied. Okay, <laughs> civil administrative investigations and criminal investigations use different standards of evidence. And so we want to preface that ours as the administrative investigation use what's called a preponderance of evidence, which is 51%. Um, the evidence collected following a diligent investigation must be and show more than likely than not that the maltreatment did or did not occur and the alleged perpetrator who more than likely than not is responsible. Preponderance of evidence is determined based on information collected from the APS investigation activities and the evidence available through law enforcement coordination. So the standard for APS civil investigations is preponderance. When we look at the criminal, it has a different threshold, often is perceived as beyond a reasonable doubt, and has to have intent. That higher evidentiary standard um, is explained and in some of our statutes is identified, but remember that it's criminal. Our threshold is much less. APS is the LIA is responsible for conducting the civil investigation and making those determinations as to if the v victim is a VA, if the maltreatment occurred and hold the a perpetrator responsible. So definitions for these incidents that meet the definition of crime may not be consistent with the civil investigations and we want to make sure you understand that. I think you mean criminal, right? Uh, definitions for incident that meet the definition of crime may not be consistent with the civil definition. So, yes. All right, so let's look at our determinations here. Um, Investigation determinations is required for each allegation accepted for investigations by the LIA or by the county. So we wanted to touch on the fact that last year Melissa and I met with APS supervisors across the state. And what we discovered are there are times when agencies are using or interpreting these determinations incorrectly. So we want to talk about them a little bit, and that's the intention of having this video conference. So when we talk about substantiated, this means that a preponderance of the evidence shows that an act that meets the definition of maltreatment occurred. Inconclusive. The definition says there is less than a preponderance of evidence to show that the maltreatment did or did not occur. False. A preponderance of evidence shows that an act that meets the definition of maltreatment did not occur. So the next two, which are options for determinations, are the ones that have been a little bit confusing as well. First one is no determination, not a VA. What this means is, as the LIA does not have the authority to make an investigation determination when the person identified as the vulnerable adult is found to not meet the definition within the statute of 626-5572 subdivision 21 which defines vulnerable adult. 
The last one is no determination investigation not possible. No determination will be made as activities required for investigation were unable to be conducted following diligent investigation efforts. And first and foremost, when you would use this, would be when the vulnerable adult is unable to be located. So when we look at this a little bit more, we want to make sure that you guys understand something. Civil determinations, also known as administrative determinations, are made regardless of the identity of the alleged perpetrator as a minor, another VA, or if the perpetrator is unable to be identified following diligent efforts. So sometimes counties get reports in regards to unknown with no name, or they get a report in regards to a scammer somebody who has taken advantage of the situation in the community, such as home repairs or lawn, lawn services. If that identity of that report, if that identity of that alleged per perpetrator is unknown, counties can still make a determination finding for that. What we discovered was sometimes there was a lot of inconclusive decisions made. And when we worked with the supervisors on these one-on-ones, they would give us examples of when they would use that. And one of them was, it was a scam. We didn't know who the scammer was. And so we want to really clarify that using the appropriate decision and determination within your case is going to make our data correct. And that's important. Um, APS must coordinate investigations of civil reports with law enforcement when the civil allegations have a crime against a vulnerable adult. This is a big one. Pardon? This is a big one. This is a big one. So the responsibility of the LA to coordinate with law enforcement re exists regardless of, of, um, of whether or not Law enforcement determines that there's a crime or not a crime. Law enforcement takes the lead in any cases that have a potential criminal component, which means you need to kind of follow behind them on your investigation. You are not pursuing things without coordinating with them, without getting approval through them to do certain interviews, to have certain contacts. So we want to make sure that we stress that. Requirements of APA APS to coordinate with law enforcement exists throughout the duration of the investigation. And so we really want to make sure that our workers know that. Investigation disposition by APS is not dependent on law enforcement's criminal investigation. And so what we found was we found some counties were making decisions of false in their civil investigation. And the reason they were making that, Angelo, was because they were making a false determination because law enforcement decided there wasn't a criminal component. Right. But the reality is, is that threshold of evidence is much lower for a civil investigation than it is for a criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. And so when we asked of examples of cases by county supervisors that that would have occurred, there was at least 51% to either substantiate or not substantiate and make it a false finding. And so there was some confusion with our determinations and this is why we kind of thought it was important to have this presentation today. Anything else to add? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off of that. You know, just because a crime wasn't necessarily committed or you don't have evidence that a crime was committed um, or the police did not determine that a crime was committed doesn't mean that there was not a civil infraction, that this person was um, suffered some maltreatment but regardless of the fact that this person isn't going to go to jail or, you know, be arrested. Right. So, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Oh. So now we're going to look at a little bit of data. And I was really excited when Peter got our data and placed it on this uh, slide presentation. So in 2018, we had 26,414 allegations that were received by the county for adult protection. You guys thought you were busy. You were, okay? So of those allegations, 9,805 were accepted for county adult protection investigation. When we break that down a step further, what we found was the allegations were separated out. So substantiated out of those allegations was 1,392. False was 3,662. Inconclusive was 2,522. No 
determination investigation not possible, which we discussed earlier, should really only been used when you can't locate the VA. And that was 1,293. The last one, not a VA, was 936. Now, I like seeing the 936 because that means not only did the county workers open a case with enough information to believe that there is a potential of maltreatment, but they took the effort to find out if there was a VA or not a VA. Because as Angelo indicated initially, one of our principles is to um, protect the integrity of individuals that these reports come in. And if you believe that somebody potentially is not a VA, then first and foremost, you have to establish that in your investigation because you don't want to trump on anybody's rights that are not meeting the definition of the vulnerable adult. So just because something was substantiated, it doesn't mean that something challenging or difficult didn't happen to the VA. So it's, rem it's really important to remember, when you open these cases, you had contact and you had interactions with vulnerable adults. And that, first and foremost, sets precedence of how those relationships will be established, how the coordination and efforts and willingness of that vulnerable adult will move forward in your case. When we look at the colored part of the chart, we see a little di bit different view. Inconclusive was 26% of the determinations. And so as we discussed earlier, when we were looking at how do you make a decision and which determination do you pick, we found that inconclusive was the most common. Now, we understand that sometimes the inconclusive is made because of the ethical dilemmas that workers fall into in regards to substantiating self-neglect or substantiating a caregiver. And so in 2018, we moved forward and established some caregiver versus self-neglect policy in regards to making determinations in those cases. And I look forward to the 2019 data because I think we're going to see a change in that. Um, what we did was we really want to look at is the vulnerable adult making this choice? Is the individual for the inconclusive decision of a caregiver, somebody that's a family member or a spouse who suffers from their own medical mental ailments that could have them be have much resistance and difficulty in meeting another individual's need, let alone their own? And so when the public looks at this data, it's a challenge. It may not make sense, but what we're seeing and understanding is we needed to make sure that the interpretation of the determinations, which one is used and when, make a little bit more sense to our county partners. In addition, you have no determination investigation not possible at 13% based on the numbers, no determination not a VA at 10%. Substantiated was 14% and false was 37%. All right, so let's talk about successful APS investigations. So what does that look like? So you get evidence, you make a supportable conclusion, and then you choose an appropriate determination. So we cannot stress this enough today that law enforcement is the lead investigator when an allegation is a crime, it's criminal. Adult Protective Services is not trained in criminal investigation or evidence gathering. So you incorporate the policy of law enforcement. Um, you you uh, do not impede a, a, a criminal investigation. You work with them. You collaborate with them. You do not in, um, uh, in, uh, interview victims or potential victims or perpetrators without first getting uh, permission to do so uh, from law enforcement so that you uh, save the integrity of that criminal investigation. So It also protects the vulnerable adult yeah. to not be re-traumatized with two interviews. And the least impact is the most important that we have on our vulnerable adults. Right. So no disruption to the lifestyle, their safety, their mental well-being, their emotional well-being is important. So yes, I agree. 
So let's look at relevant evidence for Adult Protective Services investigations. So what is evidence? We talk about evidence quite a bit um, thus far, but let's define what evidence is. And so there are four main categories listed in the uh, NAPSA National Adult Protective Services Association um, in their guidebook. And the first group is general evidence. So general evidence um, includes some examples of medical records, uh, provider records, lab work, plans of care, discharge plans, um, men choice assessments, financial records, uh, powers of attorney, copies of checks, signature cards, um, all of the statements and interviews that you gather during the investigative activities or actions that you take, those are considered um, or examples of general evidence. And then the second um, category would be physical abuse. So um, were there medical records or procedures that, um, that were done? And does that medical or physical evidence match the suspects or the victim's uh, statements, witness statements, things of that nature? Um, additionally, is the victim taking medication that could bruise them, for example, um, easily? Does the medical history or mental health experts of the individual support the assertion or the reason um, that was given for the incident. Um, what are you, the observations of the victim or the witness at different times? Um, what are your, as the investigator, what are your observations of the victim during different time periods? So that would be some physical abuse um, examples of evidence. The third is neglect. And so we talked a little bit about self-neglect caregiver neglect. So let me ask a few questions uh, for you to think about when filing a report of, of um, neglect. So are there significant resources or sufficient resources to provide for the victim's needs? Um, has the victim's capacity changed over time? Is there a caregiver? Um, do friends or family members support statements that are in the more in the mark report um, so have you talked to them um, is there doc documentations of this person's wishes such as a, D a DNR um, things like that and then the fourth category um, and this is where you start to have to collaborate with um, uh, law enforcement agencies but be sexual abuse um, allegations or sexual um, sexual assault because that is a crime. So if the victim has the capacity, what is the victim's account of what happened? Again, we want to do one interview so that the individual is not re-victimized, not re-traumatized. If the victim does not have capacity, um, the victim cannot give consent, plain and simple. If the victim has capacity, what is the victim's account of what happened? What does a healthcare provider say about whether appropriate caregiving techniques were being used? And so another reminder here um, is that APS does the civil investigation, law enforcement does the criminal investigation, and you can have differing determinations if a crime was um, was not determined to have occurred. You can also still make a finding um, there. So. Kelly will talk a little bit about um, how to obtain that evidence in the next slide. Yep, one of the things that Angelo said that I wanted to preface that I don't think that we use enough in the state, the NAPSA APS field guide, again, to repeat what Angelo said, pages 46 through 51, give a great sample of the evidence that um, adult protection should be looking at. And a couple things also to hone, on on, hone in on is, does your vulnerable adult have a history of refusing help? Does the alleged perpetrator have a duty to provide care? Um, has the caregiver been instructed on the victim's condition, cares, needs, and how to provide care? Mm -hmm. So a way that that would be relayed is does the caregiver attend medical appointments? Did the caregiver receive written indications in writing of the care, for example, wounds or bathing or nutrition or problems with the vulnerable adult? 
allergies, things mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. And so if that caregiver did not receive that information or didn't receive um, documentation on how to support that vulnerable adult, that's part of the evidence that would be huge for people to consider. So bolded in red on your screen, again, we cannot preface enough. Remember, APS is not law enforcement. And so typically in some of the evidence that we discussed, these cases will more than likely have a criminal component when you're looking at physical abuse or sexual abuse or significant injuries in a neglect case. You will have law enforcement and they will be able to do their expert interviews and collection of evidence as well. So when we talk about evidence, we want to preface that you need to remember we are not law enforcement. So this screen talks about, it has three clouds on it. It talks about how do you obtain evidence. Now these are word clouds, and they are things that Angelo and I kind of walked through with the assistance of Peter too, um, walked through and said, what do you need with documentation that would be important? And as we've worked with counties across the state, sometimes we see very little documentation when we do a consult with them or we hear very little about the documentation that's available. So just to give as you a few, evidence. as evidence. Mm-hmm. So just to give you some examples to review the word clouds. We're wound specialist. I absolutely loved wound specialists when I did investigations. They were the experts. They were the ones that could determine the level of the wound and how long it had taken to get to the point that it was. Police reports, medical records. Medical records, we've talked about this in our trainings in um, APS 101 and 201 and now called foundations training. We talked about medical records being more specific when you request those as documentation. Um, Phone calls to the provider are kept separate in many of the facilities, um, medical facilities, uh, who is making appointments, who is calling in with concerns. Bank statements, a pharmacist is a great tool to use for documentation and um, evidence collection. When you look at collaboration, you have a lot of partners out there, adult protection workers, that you're working with and you're coordinating with. For example, um, one of them is, Melissa always jokes about the automated pawn system, which has an abbreviation of APS, but that is a great system when you have theft or financial exploitation where somebody's selling off things. That is a system that tracks everything that goes in and out of a pawn shop. We have the ombudsman's office who are great advocates for um, vulnerable adults and what their choices and what they want, their wishes are. We have schools, hospitals, the home health nurse, um, PCAs can be a great avenue of a resource, and um, financial institutions. More and more as I attend multidisciplinary teams across the state, I'm seeing a few more banks at the table, which is Mm -hmm. nice. As far as interviews go, we look at the guardian interview. We look at all the witnesses that you could identify within your case that would be pertinent to your case. We look at the person alleged responsible. And we talk very briefly at the beginning about working with that alleged perpetrator. We want to really preface to you guys that um, those alleged perpetrators that are identified in a report need to always be treated with respect and dignity as well. Um, to be able to interview them and talk to them via phone and even in written communication respectfully is first and foremost the the intention of what we set forth in our policy. You can interview bank tellers. One uh, a recent county indicated that the vulnerable adult went to the same bank teller for 37 years and all of a sudden one day she came in and spoke to a different bank teller and it was a red flag for that bank because those bank tellers become really close to the people that visit them. Professionals, collaterals, so these are just a few that we wanted to preface by using this cloud that we want you to think about when you look at collecting evidence. The other thing is is really important is that at any point in time when you're collecting this evidence, we want to make sure that you are using the skills as a social worker to do so. We want you to be able to incorporate trauma-informed care. We want you to have person-centered approach, and we want to be able to justify that you are by all means avoiding any additional harm to that vulnerable adult throughout this process. 
So now we look at the evidence and we say, how do we weigh this? You know, the scale shows 49%, 51%. So that's the preponderance threshold. And when we look at that, we want to make sure that we, um, as adult protection workers, have a better understanding of that. So when we look at the evidence, you have to be able to track it. One of the things that we've established is a template called an investigation summary. That template I know is time consuming, but it's going to help you sort out what you did in your case and what evidence did you collect. For example, let's just name a few. VA status first and foremost. We talk about that being the number one thing that you have to do in your investigation. Capacity status acknowledged in writing by a professional. If you are struggling with a functional definition, you know, categoricals are easy. That's a licensed eligibility because of the license or service you, re you receive. But functional is more difficult. Some counties are now turning to the medical professionals that have contact with these clients to help assist in that functional definition. Again, we mentioned wound specialist. We look at the statutory definitions of the allegations, and I want you to break them down, and we teach this in our foundation training. What evidence do you have to reiterate that a hit occurred, that a slap occurred, that a kick occurred. Did it cause physical pain, injury, or emotional distress? Even in the neglect or emotional and mental abuse, we have the terms within those definitions of um, derogatory, demeaning, belittling, yeah. harassing. Where in your investigation did you identify that those actually occurred? And so that will help you be able to make sound determinations that can be more consistent to what our policy says and being able to be accurate with the outcome of the case. Because yep. that language sometimes can be ambiguous if we just say it's demeaning. Well, what exactly does that mean? If you provide examples, gather evidence to support this person being uh, degraded, it's much stronger. Yep. And we talk about that at foundations, not that I keep saying that, but, you know, when you talk about degrading, we actually teach that go look it up in the Webster's Dictionary because it gives you a definition and makes you unblock your sometimes tunnel vision to what you think demeaning means or derogatory means. And it helps being able to clarify where in this investigation did you find that somebody was belittling demeaning by that definition? Or neglect, that, can, um, that one too. You know, poverty versus, you know, neglect. Is there sufficient um, resources? Um, I think that that's also an area, too, where a definition um, could provide some clarity on whether or not this person is being neglected or if they're just poor and don't have the resources. Absolutely. That's huge, Angela. I'm glad you brought that up. And as well as caregivers, a caregiver neglect. We have often seen situations where a caregiver has a first-stage dementia and yet they have a poor gait and ability of mobility, and yet they're responsible to take on their spouse. Right. And it's very difficult to be able to meet that spouse needs, let alone their own mm -hmm. needs, which we talked about. So that's why we created that policy in regards to caregiver versus self-neglect that we expect every county when they get a caregiver or a self-neglect report to open that policy and go through that channel of what the questions are within that policy to help be clear on, on what that allegation could be, and then change it if you have to change it. Anything else to add on Wayne? Okay. So making a supportable conclusion is our next slide. And so what supporting documentation is needed to make the best conclusion? We talked about a lot. When making the final determination, who was present to discuss it? And lastly, what about consultation with MDT and how it may impact the decision? So we talk about the supporting conclusion. When you go to make a decision, never make it singular on your own without consultation. And so you as adult protection workers have many avenues within your agency to consult. You have supervisor to investigator one-on-ones. You have your colleagues within your unit. You have um, your regional adult protection meetings. And then you also have your MDTs, your multidisciplinary teams. Now, I do know that we are close to getting, I think it's 94 
25% of our counties having multidisciplinary teams on our map. However, I ask you all who's listening to this today, how engaging and active are your MDTs? Are they meeting on a regular basis? Are you discussing cases in details in regards to what else can you do? What else is out there? You have a realm of experts at your beckoning when you have multidisciplinary teams, which can range from adult mental health to your county attorney to your unit to a banker, understanding the financial um, transactions that possibly occurred. You have also um, some home care agencies that attend. You have your hospital social workers attend. And so it's really an avenue that would support your decision and it would take it out of a tunnel view, only you making that decision right. and letting other experts have feedback into it because they may know, just as you indicated earlier, they might know more about that family or know more about that culture that could contribute to the allegation of maltreatment. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Choosing a determination, as we indicated earlier, we covered them basically, so now we ask you which determination finding should you use? When should you use which one? What is the procedure of each one? And what about the notices of findings? So the final disp disposition is the determination made by the lead investigative agency. And speaking solely to adult protection workers, we know that all three lead investigative agencies make determination findings based on the um, statute. Now we need to look at, is the report of alleged maltreatment one of these? Um, and how and what decision do we make at the end? Determinations that maltreatment did occur may be made when the perpetrator is unable to be determined, as we indicated earlier. What about the primary support person who is alleged to be responsible, but also integral, in, important and integral for the support of the vulnerable adult. So you have to look at that. What about self-neglect and the realities of these type of cases? We have changed the language in the letter, softened the language, and we continue to recognize the challenges between the two roles adult protection workers have. Manage investigation and social services. You have to do protective services. You are the first people very often that meet and connect with these individuals involved in any maltreatment report. And so by doing so in a respectful, kind, supportive role, sharing all of the resources that you have, not only from your agency, but within your county, is really futile to protecting the vulnerable adult and really reducing the risk of trauma, the reduce the reducing the risk of um, violation of self-determination or taking away their rights to make decisions that may be bad decisions. And so we look at this and make sure that you are considering each one of those when you look at which determination you're going to pick. So to piggyback up what Kelly just said about the two hats that investigators wear, um, when you're providing social services and social supports and resources and also doing investigative actions and activities to gather um, evidence to support whether or not there was maltreatment, um, whether or not maltreatment occurred, there are sometimes um, ethical dilemmas. And by definition, an ethical dilemma um, it kind of puts you in between a rock and a hard place. And so we look at these ethical concepts, so the ethical principles of autonomy and respecting um, the client's self-determination. We look at privacy, um, fidelity, um, accountability, justice, benevolence, um, non- um, Manifolence, uh, so to do no harm, to pr um, promote the well-being of others, to be accountable for your actions, to keep promises, honor duties, be trustworthy, um, respect the client's right to control their personal information. You know, the, it's very um, shameful sometimes um, when an, uh, a senior is a victim of a scam, for example, because they, you know, they feel 
guilty about being subjected or being taken advantage of. And so they may not want you talking to their daughter or their son and letting them know that they've been a victim of a scam because there's a little bit of embarrassment or shame there. So again, that ethical um, dilemma is there because you want to make collaterals and you want to piece um, the puzzle together, but you have to respect the privacy of that individual. And so how do you do that? Um, what do you do when there are ethical um, dilemmas and you want to do no harm, but making a determination or making a finding will impact that relationship. If you find, for example, that someone's spouse was, you know, stealing from them and causing financial, um, exploiting them financially, but they still live with this individual what do you do? And so adult protective services workers are constantly, cautiously weighing the outcomes and the risks, incorporating relevant information, and wanting successful outcomes. And so um, looking at balancing all of these things. So. All right, so the Minnesota Adult Protection Ethical Values. So our, our guiding value is every action taken by APS must balance the duty to protect the safety of the vulnerable adult and their right to self-determination. So if they make poor decisions and they are competent, if they are not going to harm um, themselves or someone else, they can do that. Um, our second value is older adults and persons with disabilities who are victims of mistreatment or maltreatment should be treated with honesty, caring, care, and respect. And so, um, you know, uh, Kelly and I attended a training, and so the way that you speak to someone who has dis a disability or perceived that they have a disability, you know, maybe... Um, if they speak slowly, you don't want to rush them. You want to connect with them to, in order to make them feel comfortable to give you their story, give you their perspective, so that you can gather as much information. You know, um, even if that means sitting there for two hours um, while this person tells you um, step by step what happened to them, it's important to give them that time, give them that respect, and give them that opportunity and space in order to um, to relay what happened to them and not be quick to, you know, like rush in with a hypothesis of what we thought happened. And then, because when you go and you try to find evidence to support that hypothesis that you walked in, most likely you will. Yeah. And, and you can make the determination before you even walked in the door. And so it's important to, um, to respect the perpetrator, even if it's an egregious allegation against them, because if you want them to admit to doing it or, you know, you still you know, want to gather the evidence, you need to be able to make them feel comfortable enough to tell you what they did. Yep. So Angela discussed the fact that we just attended um, some training. We attended collaborative safety training, and it was really really fun. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. And what it does is it really makes you think as a social worker and as an adult protective representative, um, what are your biases when you walk in the door? And you mentioned a little bit about that. And it's interesting because they showed us clips of videos of where somebody may have an extreme speech impediment with some physical disabilities as well. And the assumption is that they are disabled or they're cognitively delayed when in fact, just because they have some speech impediment or have a longer time of response to a question doesn't mean they're cognitively disabled at all. Mm -hmm. And so if if they can give you sequential events, if they can recall the correction, if you make a mistake, that person's still there um, intact um, mentally, and they just may have a speech, um, uh, some speech uh, impediments that they are working through. And so, yeah. Yep. And I even joked yesterday in front of everybody and said, when I first came into adult protection, I was shocked by how slow my interviews would go because I would ask a question and the vulnerable adult with an aging group would take some time to soak it in and then respond very slowly to my question. And I really had to take a step back and respect that mm -hmm. of those individuals and realize that could be age bias mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so it, it made my interviews 
much more interesting and engaging when I realized that because it really was respect and they appreciated that sometimes silent, awkward mm -hmm. moment. Good so. investigators are comfortable with silence. You know, if you ask an open-ended question and then they start talking, if you just wait, they'll start talking and fill in that space because nobody wants to sit there and be in that awkward silence. Yep. So before we move on to the next slide, there is something else I wanted to re reiterate. Um, when there are competing entrants, uh, interests, clients' right to exercise self-determination always outweighs their safety. Um, people have the right to take risks, to live in harmful situations if they choose, if they understand the ri those risks and... Um, they are not harming themselves or someone else. There are two exceptions to that. The first, when a client does not understand those risks and the risk of danger are substantial involuntary measures may be warranted. So if this person does not have the capacity to keep themselves out of harm um, and it's likely that it will be a substantial um, harm or death, then um, involuntary means of guardianship, um, conservatorship, things of that nature are warranted at that time. All right, supporting safety of the vulnerable adult during the investigation. So protective services, EPS, uh, standard, uh, standardized tools and procedures, and then APS workers approach. So we've discussed the important aspects of the APS investigation, but we also need to understand how best to support safety during that investigation. So supporting safety, protective services and service planning. So adult protect, um, protective services as the LIA is always um, responsible for offering protective services to the vulnerable adult in conjunction with the civil investigation. So you always offer services um, to that individual. Whether they refuse or decline is something else, but you always offer. Service planning may not be complete, um, completed concurrently with the investigation determination. So sometimes uh, that the plan, um, the services that you'll offer um, will will be based upon whether or not you substantiate or do not substantiate. So that's what that, that means there. And then the implication of the safety plan through service planning may continue after the allegation determination is made. So um, again, just to piggyback off the previous bullet point, um, after you make that determination, you may need to implement a safety plan, um, especially if this is someone who um, the perpetrator still has access to them, for example. Um, you may uh, need to implement a safety plan and, um, and plan around that, even after you've make a, made a, a determination. So here's one of my favorite slides. So we talked a little bit about supports, um, formal and informal supports, um, another word cloud um, here. I'm going to read those um, here. Sometimes informal supports are also called natural supports, and those include our um, friends, families, faith organizations, neighbors are um, examples, but children um, or you know, may come around the house and um, bring food, things like that. Um, and then on the formal uh, cloud, we have therapy, in-home nurse, PCA, Meals on Wheels, um, things of that nature. So sometimes visiting nurses, visiting physicians, so um, type of formal um, licensed uh, services, we can um, provide safety supports using um, either formal or informal supports. And then the assessment closed. So the assessment should not be closed until the APS role in service planning and intervention is completed and the vulnerable adult is safe or conditionally safe. So unless both of those things are true, do not close the assessment. So just a side note on that. This does not include keeping an assessment open for the sole purpose of a, a criminal, criminal investigation. investigation. Yep. Um, we have found cases to be opened beyond a year of a, of a mark report coming in, and when inquired, well, why would you have a case open, the response is, well, the criminal investigation is still open and those charges haven't been completed. So that piece needs to be coordinated and communicated with 
your law enforcement officials. Typically, a great avenue to do that in would be through the avenue of your multidisciplinary team. So to really let them know we don't keep our cases open um, for you, that sole reason. Mm -hmm. They have administrative and judicial authority to get more resources through different avenues mm -hmm. than just the APS workers. So. All right, supporting safety, the standardized tools and procedures. So DHS standardized, I'm sorry, DHS structured decision making and standardized tools, guidelines and procedures manual, that's a mouthful, includes the SDM initial safety assessment, the SDM strengths and needs assessment, the safety plan, and the final safety plan. And I always like to throw in, because I think there's people that don't realize it, is when you pull this up, it should be saved as one of your favorites, uh, adult protection workers, and it should be um, easily accessible on your computer. But one of the best things that about these tools, both this manual and our APS manual, is right-click and you can do find and find exactly what you're looking mm -hmm. for within that. Unless your find word is investigation, because you will find a million of those, or if your find word is um, vulnerable adult that's in there quite a bit, but I have found the find tool to be amazing for this, so. All right, supporting safety, um, APS workers approach. Approach by APS workers support safety with, again, person-centered um, services, knowledge of trauma-informed care, client self-determination uh, must be acknowledged. All right, so let's do a brief review and um, summarize kind of what we've discovered here. We're going to do this by using the NAPSA case closure checklist, and we're going to look at measuring outcomes. So when we look at the NAPSA case closure checklist, this is something that we um, just did as our unit is getting NAPSA certified for the curriculum through CORE. We discovered this good awesome case closure checklist. Now we do have the APS checklist that we use within our agency that's online and both at the end of the manual, but this checklist is also prevalent and it kind of covers things in a different little bit of a topic. So you have first create and update your risk assessments. So that's part of our structured decision making tools and if the vulnerable adult is deemed at risk or um, the original safety assessment is at risk, then you're going to do another one at the end. It ensures you have addressed all the domains of the client situation and the environmental conditions, the physical and mental well-being of the vulnerable adult, their finances, social support, and any capacity issues. Next, you look at collect evidence as required. So we talked a lot about evidence and just to reiterate, that could include photos, documents, victims, collateral statements, bank statements, or any other evidence pertinent to, pertinent to the case to reach your 51% preponderance threshold to determine which finding you're going to make. The next one is investigate and document. Now, we know that documentation is a struggle because it's time consuming. Now, because you're collecting a lot of records, that information is within your file. At minimal, we strongly suggest that you just enter that the documentation is within the hard file within SSIS. You also do your investigation and you document because it assures that all of the facts and the information is available to whoever looks at your case. And there are a lot of people that potentially could have access and look at your case. To name a few, which we stress in our, in our all-day training is the DHS background study unit. Um, perpetrators and or vulnerable adults have rights to have information that is in within your case as well. Now granted you would go through your data privacy official also known as your DPO within your agency to redact what is not eligible to that individual but there's a lot of people that have access to your case or request of your records. 
Next area would be verify protective services offered and provided. First and foremost, we want to make sure that our vulnerable adults are protected and that any and all services were clearly documented and clearly made available, even if they've accepted or declined. Those are important. The next one is ensure reasonable efforts. Ensure you've tried everything on behalf of your client to best serve your client because that is who you are as a social worker. Your effort is to protect, pr protect and provide services to better the quality and independence and integrity of that vulnerable adult in their life. The next one is uh, notify all agencies or boards as needed. Now we do have an interface within our system that does do some notification to the background study, but it does not include other agencies or boards as needed. For example, the licensing board um, for physicians, for psychiatrists, for doctors in general, or for nurses. We have to look at those, those appropriate boards as needed. We also, the next one would be inform client of case case closure. Now a lot of people will just send the notice and, and be done with the appropriate due process that's explained in there. But NAPSA says specifically, inform client of case closure and we want to take it a step further. When you have self-neglect or caregiver neglect cases, we really would ask for you to think twice about how you deliver those notices because a self-neglect determination could be very detrimental to a vulnerable adult and it could have trauma when they open this letter and realize they were determined to have self-neglected themselves. So one of the things we have talked about in cases where you have to make a de decision of substantiated in a self-neglect or substantiated in a caregiver neglect, the suggestion is, is take the extra time to explain. I'm not coming to pick you up and place you in a facility just because I made this decision. Law enforcement's not going to come and arrest you. This will not be on a criminal record if you get a speeding ticket. It's that your agency had enough concerns to make the decision that they made and to be able to communicate that to the client because that's their right mm -hmm. and they have that right to receive that. So think about that when you do those kind of notices. Um, it's important to be able to still in your head trying to, to avoid any additional trauma or emotional um, damage from that notice. The last one is um, closing case summary um, to supervisor is how NAPSA words it. How we talk about it is our investigation summary. Those summaries have been so beneficial um, to county workers and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, you're taking that information, you're placing it in a document of all the evidence that you collected to support determination and decision you made. But in addition to that, if anything came out of that case, such as uh, administrative um, review or an appeal or maybe um, a maltreatment review team, which is a team of uh, professionals at the state level, which um, the vulnerable adult has the right to go to and ask for a reversal of that decision, this investigation summary is going to be within the file. Workers, we know that you are busy, you are multitasking, you are doing multiple programs, and this investigation summary will secure your history of the case. Whether you leave the agency and somebody else has to defend the actions of your case, or whether or not this case goes through a judicial process of whether it's a guardianship, or a conservatorship, or a criminal charge, it gives that history, and those cases can take a long time to get through the courts. So we can't stress enough that the case closing summary is really important. Now we would like to point out that MDH and DHS licensing provide a public investigation memorandum, which is on their websites. Counties do not provide that for anybody attending that is not county APS. In Minnesota, we do not disclose at the county level um, to anybody except for the vulnerable adult, the alleged perpetrator, and if deemed appropriate by the county agency, an interested party. And some of those parties may include a power of attorney or a guardian or a conservator, but we do not release that. 
In fact, reporters are only privy to an initial disposition for an alleged maltreatment allegation. They are not privy to an emergency protective service request where the county has to respond to imminent harm or danger to the vulnerable adult, which is an option in filing a report. Reporters are not privy to a notice of finding unless they are defined as an interested party, which may be the case, say, a guardian files a report. Mm -hmm. A guardian is identified in the language of the law as an interested party. So we want to make sure you understand that. So in an overview, um, notice of findings letters, they were created to meet the requirements of the Vulnerable Adult Act. This is part of our 626557, also known as the Vulnerable Adult Act. Some people use the term VAA. Uh, perpetrators of maltreatment should receive the notice of right of reconsideration and appeal of perpetrator of a maltreatment letter. So SSS, SSIS, which is our social service information system for those not county employees on this web conference, has state generated notices. We want to stress the fact that you have to make sure that those due process rights and explanations are at the end of every one of your notices and that they're available to the perpetrator as well as the vulnerable adult. They also are explained those rights. We also encourage that before you mail them in an envelope that you read them, that you have selected all the appropriate persons and parties within that case before you mail them. We've had some situations where somebody may call the state because there was um, the wrong letter went to the wrong party and the due process and the rights of that individual were swapped and changed. And so that's huge. Um, notification letters are also found in SSIS under documentation. It's the statewide tracking system. So we use these based on debt, based on the law that governs us to do so. So it says 626557 subdivision, subdivision 9G states, the Commissioner of Human Services shall maintain a central database for the collection of common entry data point data, lead investigative agency data, including maltreatment report disposition and appeal data. Um, the common entry point shall have access to the centralized database and must log the reports into the database immediately. So we incorporated MARC in 2015 and now we have all of our data within the SSIS system. So a lot of people ask, why do we have to use your letters? Why is it um, important? Because this is all mapped accordingly. And it's important to be able to reflect the appropriate decisions and actions of each agency based on the statewide system. So we wanted to make sure that you guys all understood that. Anything to add? That was a long one. <laughs> My throat hurts from that. No, but, I have nothing to add. Okay. Measuring outcomes. What is the evidence that the client is safer and no longer at risk, or at least reduced risk? So this is a fun slide that Peter created, and it's word clouds. And so Angelo and I are going to take turns reading these. But we want to point out that this is part of the NAPSA field guide, again, at page 122. So if you find that any of this is important that you want to add to your agency's checklist for case closures or making determinations, feel free to do that. So the next one is what is the evidence that the client's self-determination was respected and the least restrictive interventions were taken? Does the determination meet the evidence threshold of preponderance? So more likely than not that this occurred. Does your documentation within the file match your decision? When we see a case that has substantiated, and I go into chronology of the live case and see nothing in chronology, I have a little bit of concern about that. Okay. Just a little bit? Just a little bit. <laughs> what is the evidence that the case was handled ethically and legally and agency pr procedures were followed? Are investigation summary lays out what the protocols are, 
what each adult protection worker is delegated to do. We separate um, your documentation. How does it meet the statute? Which statute does it meet? What's your decision? So we actually did a great job on that investigation summary, getting that in there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our <laughs> information for us is DHS dot adult protection at state dot MN dot US and telephone number is six five one four three one two six zero nine and you can always visit our website at uh, http colon slash slash mn dot gov slash dhs slash again. So oh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Copyright 2019 State of Minnesota Department of Human Services. Produced by Minnesota Department of Human Services, 444 Lafayette Road, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55155. 651-431-2000. Toll free, 800-657-3663. Toll free TTY, 800-627-3529. Video phone, 651-964-1514. Website https colon slash slash mn dot gov slash dhs. The Minnesota Department of Human Services, DHS, prohibits discrimination in its public services because of race, color, creed, religion, political beliefs, national origin, sex, public assistance status, marital status, age, sexual orientation, or disability. Direct discrimination complaints to the DHS Civil Rights Coordinator at dhs.info at state.mn.us or 651-431-2000. Individuals with disabilities may request reasonable modifications to receive DHS services by contacting its Americans with Disabilities Act Coordinator at dhs underscore ADA at state.mn.us or 651-431-2000. 3040.